I made a decision on the spur of the moment this afternoon to uh, create this entry. So I kind of hurriedly got my ducks in a row. Hopefully I haven't missed anything. I have talked about Matthew Franklin Whittier's using a star as his secret go-to pseudonym really off and on throughout his 50-year career. Beginning, as I now see, um, and I mentioned recently, in 1829, going all the way to at least 1873. But um, what I wanted to show you today is that Matthew left posterity a huge whopping clue that he was, in fact, the author of the star. And I want to show you how he did that. We shouldn't have to go too far astray here in order to accomplish this. Whereas in the previous entry, I deliberately went all over the place trying to show all these different interconnections in the tapestry, as I called it. This time I'm going to try to stay focused and hopefully this won't take too long. So what we want to do is to go into the 1855 Portland transcript. This is in beautiful condition for the most part. And um, what we've got to do is to get into the middle of this, so the, towards the end, in the fall, I think it is. And I will go ahead and do that, try not to bump the computer. I'll be putting these up on the screen as well. I haven't made the shots yet, but I will. If, I, I said this, this volume is in beautiful condition, but it's a little yellowed. So uh, I'll probably, most of these things I color correct, by the way. I don't feel embarrassed about color correcting any um, antiquarian pieces that I put up on the screen. So the first thing we need to do is to go to the October 6th, 1855 edition. But before I even do that, I need to give a little background. I think I'd rather give the background now than to bring it in piecemeal um, as we get to the references. So in 1855, Matthew was taking care of his second family. This was an arranged marriage. He couldn't live with this woman. For many years, he lived in New York and sent the money home, supported them from a distance, and then visited home. Uh, but when his third child was born, I if this was, I think, I think it's 1848. The tombstone says 1849. This is his daughter, Alice. <coughs> um I think he made the decision that he wanted to live in Portland so that he could help raise her. And she was the only one that ever uh, found happy a happy marriage and found love. So I think it worked. Um, that's speculation and my own feelings. And anyway, he lived in Portland and he worked for the post office in Portland. And it was a tough job. There's one letter he writes to his brother, I believe, about how he was pulling double shifts to fill in for a co-worker, and he had a horrible cough, a hacking cough that was keeping him up all night, and he was working double shifts. You know, he still managed to write some. That was in 1854, the year previous. Now, I'm going to go grab something I forgot to pull out of the shelf. I'll be right back, and I mean right back with the magic of editing. This is what I think is a very rare volume because I can't find it anyplace else. I managed to find one on eight books, and the only way I found it was that it was misspelled. And I checked some alternate spellings, and by gosh, I came up with one. This is the Rag Picker, or Bound and Free, which has been assumed to have been written by George Burnham, but it was published anonymously. It was not written by George Burnham. It was written by Matthew Franklin Whittier, Whittier anonymously. And the dedication to the sister on, in this book is to Elizabeth Whittier, not to any sister of George Burnham. This was reviewed glowingly in The Liberator and uh, excerpted twice at length. So the gist of that is that the only real, well, I could go in in great depth on this, but the main relevance is that this was published in October of 1855, and he had some money. Now, he had been telling his brother in years previous, several years previous, that he really wanted to buy a farm, and I think he did. He apparently had lived where I am now. This, this used to be Westbrook, so he'd lived somewhere around where I am now, and I think he bought a farm here. 
So just keep that in the back of your mind. That that's my conclusion that when he had this money from having sold the rag picker, that he had some money and he he bought a farm. It would it would have been probably here in Westbrook, which is only a couple miles or so out of Portland, so that he could bring his kids to, to visit him, and especially Alice, who he wanted to help raise. So that's a little background for us. Now, um, you may know that Matthew is historically known as, and only as, the author of a character named Ethan Spike. That was not revealed to the public until 1857. Two years later, in the middle of some time in 1857, Matthew indicates, writing as a character he calls Old Casual, that the public now knows that he is Ethan Spike. Up until then, nobody knew. Now, in the October 6th, 1855 edition, this is right about the time that the rag picker would have been published, there's one of my favorite Ethan Spike letters. And um, I don't know if I need to read it. I could just describe it. The gist of it is that Ethan Spike talks about having attended a lecture, you know, a lyceum talk, in his little town of Hornby, given by a man who discourses on astronomy, but doesn't have any idea what he's talking about. And then the minister uh, takes great offense, you know, at what he says, and the minister doesn't know what he's talking about either, and Matthew lampoons the both of them. And um, this has one of Matthew's most off-color little references here. He says at the end, he says, we've got three lectors engaged, the fust by Daniel Pratt of Boston. Now, Daniel Pratt apparently was this character who would lecture wildly, you know, just like off the top of his head. And nobody knew if he was crazy or he was acting. <laughs> That's what I gather a little bit. I've read about him. So Daniel Pratt of Boston is going to talk about the great American traveler. No, he says he's the great American traveler and the editor of the gridiron. I know that's probably a pun. Subject, Will Salt Peter Byrne. The next will be by the editor, ER, of, quote, The Genius. Subject, Baby Shows. Now, apparently, P.T. Barnum put on baby shows, and they were awful. You know, they had, I don't know if they were, any of them were uh, crippled or anything, you know, but they, they, they had these babies sitting there, and people would file by and gawk at the babies, and the babies would be crying, and, you know... <laughs> So Matthew thought that was pretty awful, so he made fun of that. Then he says, the third will begin by me. He says, subject, Orphis Seekin. It's spelled O-R-F-I-S-S-E-E-K-I-N. Now that's a reference to office seeking, which Matthew was very down on, which meant getting positions, political positions, you know, appointed. You know, so if your man won and you had done something to help him win, as a payback, you would be given an office, which was a nice, cushy, cushy job. In later years, Matthew was so reduced by shunning that he actually had to take one himself. But here he's making fun of them, and it's spelled in such a way that it sounds like orifice-seeking, which is what he thought of office-seeking. Okay? O-R-F-I-C-E. Apparently, he got right past the editor. <laughs> so Matthew could be pretty racy when he wanted to be. So that was the letter from Ethan Spike. Now we go to the next edition, the very next week. This is a weekly paper. We're now in the October 13, 1855 edition. Okay, so now we're going to get into it. Now there's a little more history that I need to give, and that is that um, a lot more history, but I'll keep it very condensed. As I've mentioned before, Matthew wrote for the New York Tribune, from the fall of 1844 until mid-1846, signing with his star signature, rumor got around that that was the literary editor, Margaret Fuller. She eventually admitted, quote-unquote, that it was her, and when she went to Europe, she continued to use it. But it wasn't her. It was Matthew Franklin Whittier freelancing for the Tribune. And I, I'm going to write a whole paper on this subject, so I won't get into that now. I have written a whole paper. I mean, I'm shortly going to release it. Uh, so Margaret Fuller used this star. And then, now I've got to get my notes out. Not 
like a week or two after she died, she died in a tragic accident off the coast of New York City with her husband and son in a ship. And that was July 19, 1850. Not long at all after that, like a week or two, Henry Ward Beecher begins to write letters home. And those letters in 1855 are all published as the Star Papers, see? But he actually started writing these. Like, I don't know if he, if he wrote them with a star back in August of 1850, because the first one is undated. The second one is August 4, 1850, and Fuller had just died on July 19, 1850. So anyway, when he published them in 1855, he called them the Star Papers, and they were published. They came out in July of 1855. Matthew is now writing in October of 1855, so just a few months later, and he's going to mention these. The gist of this, I think, is that Matthew was fed up with people using that signature, and he couldn't come out and tell anybody about it then, but he could leave coded messages to make sure that posterity knew how to separate out what was his from these imitators or these people that were appropriating his long-time signature since 1829. Okay, so there's your context. Now, here we have original correspondence, a letter from the country, now, I believe this is Matthew actually writing from where I am now, Westbrook, um, to the editor of the Portland Transcript, which is just like two miles away. I think they were on uh, like Exchange Street, I think. So, anyways, like two-mile walk, basically. But he's writing as though he's a long ways off in the country. And he's writing to the editor, who is Edward Elwell. And he says, I'm going to get a sip of water here very carefully around this paper. I've not yet spilled water on one of these, and I don't intend to start today. Now, this I'm going to read in its entirety. This is what's going to take up the bulk of our uh, session today, and then we're done. Mr. Editors, a letter from the country is hardly in demand for the columns of your paper, I suppose, as I understand one of you lives in the country and has an eye to the facts and fancies of rural life and many thousands of your readers are better versed in matters agricultural, horticultural, and rusticultural than is your humble correspondent. Beg pardon for that last. I said humble correspondent, but that was only a matter of form. I feel as far from humble as the biggest and best of you, for please understand that I have become one of the lords of the soil, one of friend Carey's true, quote, nobility, the unconquerable yeomanry of Maine. He means he bought a farm. This is something he'd been wanting to do for a long time. <clears throat> we, sirs, why haven't I as good a right to say we as if I were an editor, I should like to know. And he, he was, well, he actually had been an editor and was well qualified to be one. Well, then, we, that is to say I, have a farm, and a mighty agreeable change it is, I can assure you, from the pent-up life of a city office, meaning the post office where he was working. We have been longing all summer to give you some account of our corn and potatoes, our clover and timothy, our squashes and pumpkins, parentheses, throw away that foolish pea, Mr. Printer, and spell them plain and straight, pumpkins. Our, quote, pumpkins this year are some, we can assure you, now, I've told you many times, or I think I've told you many times, one of Matthew's favorite expressions was some pumpkins. Then that derived from his childhood when apparently he had that nickname because he was kind of an energetic, mischievous boy, and they called him some pumpkins. So here he's brought it in again. And the last time I checked, you know, to see how many times he had used that, I told you there were some I didn't pick up because they, he didn't, you know, write it exactly that way. Well, this is an example. It says, our pumpkins this year are italic some, we can assure you. Well, that's a reference to some pumpkins. That identifies it as Matthew right there. Not the dwarfed and half-ripened affairs that are often found in your city market, but regular rousers in size and quality. The corn, too, stands almost ripe and bristles on the field like an army ready to march for Sevastopol. It says, P.S., after the storm. 
Said corn is somewhat shattered by the recent action and stands a little irregular in rank and file. Time would fail me to tell you of the potatoes and turnips and onions and carrots. Suffice it to say, they have all been trying to do their best to encourage a new farmer and will no doubt pay for their raising. So will our sweet potatoes, but we have to use some arithmetical tactics to make it profitable. Thus, my account with this section of my garden stands somewhat thus. Now, first of all, Matthew was raised on a farm, so he knows farming. Might be a little rusty, you know, and he might not know all the most current techniques, but he knows how to farm. And he also freelances as a bookkeeper, so he knows bookkeeping. Convolvulus batatus to, quote, our garden doctor to 500 slips at one dollar five dollars ditto one day's labor in setting 50 cents ditto six days labor hoeing three dollars ditto one uh, day's labor digging thrown in zero eight dollars fifty cents and he goes on and comes up with a grand total a net gain of three dollars and seventy cents in this estimate to be sure we have reckoned our labor at a low figure and entered the potatoes at the highest market price for early southern but the pleasure of raising them is worth all that we have marked in the account and we consider it a fair speculation now all of this is just set up none of this is why he's writing it's just filler it's excuse to be writing for what he's going to end with okay perhaps some others of your readers will try the experiment another season but the finest, quote, country product, which is just now coming off, is the autumn foliage. Why, my dear sirs, it is, it is grand, glorious, magnificent. Words fail, as you will see, to convey any adequate notion of the superlative sublimity of these fiery forests, which stretch over the country like a troop of blazing comets. Scarlet and green and gold are the prominent colors in Marm Nature's autumn dress and she flaunts them as gaily as a young bride, forgetting that she is a poor, quote, decayed widow. Now, back in the Ethan Spike story that appeared the previous week, he went on some length about the lecturer's discussion on wild comics. He meant comets, but he was speaking of himself as a wild comic. So it was um, a parallel, you know, discussion where he was supposedly reporting on the lecturer's talk about wild comets, but he was actually talking about himself as a wild comic, as a metaphor, see? So anyway, he's identifying the comet with that previous Ethan Spike piece. So that much you need to know. Now, Mrs. Editors, if you will ride over to blank, please notice the mail mark and inquire for us. We will entreat you to a little new cider and he's inviting them, and give you as many apples as you can eat and pocket, and show you some of the nicest forest and mountain scenery in the whole region round about. This is probably not an idle invitation. He knows these people personally, and he's inviting them to his farm. Your city people think of the country only as a fit resort for a few days in midsummer, but for glory and beauty, for charming quiet, the perfect spirit of repose, October, in its better moods, stands before all other seasons. Mellow atmosphere at noon, variegated woods, loaded orchards, fields of corn and pumpkins yet ungathered, the satisfied feeling which all nature seems to exhibit in review of the season's work well done, all in all, make early October in the country more charming than June. Come and see. You will excuse a farmer's rough hand, and I will try and give you another letter or so by husking time. Well, he has, Matthew knows calligraphy, so that's just totally ironic. I don't know if he's writing hurriedly or something, but basically he writes in calligraphy. Now, now this is the last paragraph, and he's built up this whole thing, just basically inviting the editors to come visit him at his new farm in the country, which he bought with the proceeds of the rag picker. And now he's going to get to business. By the way, can't you reckon me a, quote, special correspondent? Suppose you should allow me a corner in your editorial columns. He actually does want to write for the transcript, you know, and he's only allowed to submit. He never was made part of the staff that I know of. He was a reporter for them, but not staff. 
to distinguish me from yourselves, you may give me some sort of signature. Uh, asterisk star would do. But that would be rather too ambitious for a green hand. He's used this since 1829. Besides being appropriated by a distinguished correspondent of a certain New York paper. That's Henry Ward Beecher, who's writing for the Independent with the Star. Apparently, apparently he used it before he called them the Star Papers. He actually signed those things with a star in the New York Independent. And if he did that from the very beginning, then he was doing that a week or so after Margaret Fuller died. It's unbelievable. And I'd like to nail that down and know for sure, but that's sure what it looks like. Perhaps it would be quite as suitable to mark my wandering paragraphs by the sign of that other class of heavenly bodies, known in the communication of your other correspondent, the Honorable Ethan Spike Esquire, as, quote, comics. Okay, so nobody knows Matthew is Ethan Spike. He's calling him another writer. But, you know, everybody, I mean, certainly the editors know that he's Ethan Spike. So he's bringing in now his other character, Ethan Spike, as himself. And he's referring to what he said in the previous Ethan Spike story, in the previous entry, about comics as a wild comic. So let me read that again. Perhaps it would be quite suitable to mark my wandering paragraphs by the sign of that other class of heavenly bodies. And by the way, in, in Ethan Spike, he called them heavingly bodies. That was the other racy uh, little malapropism that he used. But anyway, I'm going to go back again. Perhaps it would be quite as suitable to mark my wandering paragraphs by the sign of that other class of heavenly bodies, known in the communication of your other correspondent, the Honorable Ethan Spike Esquire, as, quote, comics. I shall venture thus to sign myself, distinctly endeavoring in all future flights, not to obscure the star, asterisk, that shines over Berkshire Hills, and the symbol underneath is a comet. So, I mean, catch this now. He's saying he would sign as a star, except that Henry Ward Beecher has appropriated it, you see, and therefore he will sign as the comet, which identifies him as Ethan Spike. Now, note this line. To distinguish me from yourselves, you may give me some sort of a signature. A star would do, but that would be rather too ambitious for a green hand. Besides being appropriated by a distinguished correspondent of a certain New York newspaper. Note the word appropriated. That means stolen. He should have said what? Um, introduced or... or launched or, you know, some neutral term, but he uses the word appropriated and he means it. <laughs> so this is Matthew Franklin Whittier's subtlety. What he's done at one stroke is identified himself as Ethan Spike and identified himself as the star, even though he says he's too green a hand, you know, to write with it. Well, that's total irony. So he has now identified himself as the star because we know he's Ethan Spike. So there you have it. That's all I have to do um, here today. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to be busy, and then I'll tell you what I was doing after I finish the next two, three days. There's a there's hundred other clues that Matthew was the star, you know. Uh, but this in this particular case, he signs it for posterity. He tells us, meaning us today in 2021, he tells us that he was the star. Until next time.